This is our Bible. This is God speaking to us. Our eyes are open. Our hearts are prepared to receive all the God's promises and instructions. Today we make our Bible the final authority in our life so that in every circumstance we will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we thank you for your word that has already come forth. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for confirmation. We thank you for giving us what we need when we need it. Lord God, we pray over every man, woman, and child that they get what they need today. Father God, bless my mouth, my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, and my spirit to deliver only what you would have me deliver. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here today. Amen. Amen. God is good. All right, so um, this is part two of our Connected to God, the church, and our community. Thank you, thank you, sister. Um, I'm just going to re reiterate and recap, so some things may be a little boring. Some things may be, I'm reiterating some things. Maybe you missed some things last week. Maybe you weren't here, uh, and maybe you just need to be reminded. I don't know. So here we go. So the river, welcome to the river. We are a community of real people living real lives together, discovering a real God who loves us and doesn't judge us. We've heard that many times. And he won't leave us right where we are. He'll meet us, but he won't leave us. The vision of our church, just in case you don't remember, it's on the bulletin, we like to say it all the time, is to see us all become one body united by love and discipleship. Our mission as a church is to lead and restore people to God through Jesus Christ by equipping and empowering them through biblical discipleship. We can't do it any other way. We don't do it any other way. To fulfill God's calling on their life, your life, we are discipling each other. We are discipling by teaching, hanging out together, fellowshipping, encouraging one another, what is taking place today. And to walk in unity, most importantly, love as we reach out to the community. That's our vision and mission. Vision and mission. Vision and mission. It's also in the bulletin. So if you need to be reminded where you go to church, get the bulletin. So could, this series um, is our second week. It's a 10-week series. This is the second week of our series. The purpose of this 10-week series is to deepen our connection with our God, our church, and our community. I told you before that our desire as pastors and as church is to help, you bring, help bring all people of all ages, all backgrounds into a deeper personal relationship with who you say you believe in, that is Jesus Christ. That would not only change and transform your lives of people in this church, but outside this church. That's why we, the teaching team, wanted to start this teaching series. I'll tell you, this teaching series has been, I mean, I'm a little behind because I've had to prepare for this message. I think they're a week <laughs> ahead of me. But I tell you, this has been an awesome study that we're studying. And I'm so thankful for it because it has surely, surely, surely opened my eyes. So our goal is when you leave here each Sunday, you will know or be close to knowing the call that God has in your life. That's for each and every one of us. So be prepared. Come expecting. Come believing. Come trusting. Come with your Bibles, your Bible app, your notes, pens, whatever you need to get on the same page. Bring it. Because when you finish this series, you will not be the same. That is our prayer, and that should be your prayer. Amen? So in last week's message... We talked about being radical. Yes, I said radical. It can be negative and positive depending on who's judging. But to be a radical counterculture follower of Jesus Christ is being radical. When you follow a, 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 a someone that is requiring you to put your faith and trust in him, that's considered radical. Because everything Jesus did was counter to the world's way of thinking and the world's way of doing things. And to follow him is considered radical. Why? Because his love, his forgiveness, his grace and mercy was in direct odds with the world. Direct odds with the world. Shun the herd instinct. He was the only one over here when everybody else was here. Shun the herd instinct. He didn't do what everybody else did. He didn't leave you hanging when you, when you, were, when you were broke. At the 11th hour and 59 second, he showed up faster than anyone else showed up on you. Amen? The world doesn't teach us or show us how to forgive. 
The world doesn't teach us or give extends grace like he does. The world doesn't know, show us any mercy. You do something wrong, you will be plastered everywhere that everywhere can be plastered. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. So these things are considered radical. Try walking, taking the high road when someone gets you angry. Instead of cussing and fussing them, fussing at them, you take the high road. That's not, con hey, wait, 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 you, you got to stand up to these people. You can't let them push you over. I talked to a young man and said his goal, he was striving to, you know, it's like with guys. You know, guys, you know, are guys. And when you do things with guys, sometimes guys' chest puffs, the, you know, the chest becomes bigger when they do things in front of guys. And he was saying, you know, you don't have to prove yourself to people. You don't always have to win an argument. You don't always have to, your chest doesn't always have to, you don't have to always inhale to get your chest out. You know, sometimes it's best to keep your chest where it is and keep walking and be quiet, be humble. You know what, you want to go down that road, you go ahead. I'm not going there. I had a guy in the grocery store, true story. Um, I was standing in line with him and we were, I was kind of close to him because we were putting our things there. And he said, you're standing kind of close to me. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm just sitting there going like, oh, I, well, I don't know where else to stand. I'm, I'm, st I'm, standing, in, I'm standing in line. I, mean, I ain't telling him that, but I'm thinking in my mind, like, I, I, I ain't got nowhere else to go. <laughs> so, of course, Pastor Timothy over here trying to figure it all out says, babe, just, you know, why don't you just move over a little or something. And I'm going, well, I'm, I'm, I'm as far as I'm going to go. So he got a little irate with me. And I just stood there. I didn't say nothing to him. He's a big dude. And you, sometimes you don't want to mess with short dudes. <laughs> you don't want to mess with them. I'm not saying I'd have done anything to him. Maybe, maybe he would be, beat my butt. But the thing is, I stood there because I was not trying to prove a point. I stood there because I stood there because I was right. And I stood there because I didn't say anything to him. And I stood my ground. I could have said something to him. I could have provoked him. He was wrong. I was right. I didn't go, oh, I'm right, you know, Timberly, you know, past, you know, Timberly, hey, babe, you know, I was standing there going right, and I'm doing the right thing. No, I just stood my ground. I was like, be that as it may. I didn't open my mouth, say a thing. He was the only one that felt and looked like a fool. So sometimes you just got to hush, hush. Don't say things. You ain't got nobody to prove but to God. Hopefully that helps someone, especially a short guy out there. <laughs> According to dictionary.com, I read this last time, but I want to reiterate this. Radical means a person who holds or follows strong convictions and extreme principles by direct and often uncompromising methods or the way in doing things. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. So if you have strong conviction, extreme principles, and uncompromising methods, then you are radical. Because you believe in something. Now that can be, you can take that either way, but today we're going to take it the right way. We follow Jesus. We are radical. Accept and own that name. If you're abstaining from sex until you're married, then you're a radical. If you give back to God what he's given to you, then you're a radical. They don't teach you none of that out there in the world. They teach us these things in school that we hardly don't even use in the real world. Where are the trade schools and things like that? Right. You know, Brandon, I think Brandon took, uh, what's math? Uh, thank you. I think he was telling Pat, uh, Trinity, his sister, that um, uh, one of the math things he's doing, I don't know, I'm not in school, I'm, I'm, I'm way beyond school, but one of the math things he, he's doing for his, this course, he doesn't really need in the real world. I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying there's certain things that they're not teaching us that what we're, what we're learning, we're not, it's not applicable in the real world. That's what I'm trying to say. Excuse me for a moment. If you make the Bible the final authority in your life, then you're a radical. If you say, wait, wait, hold on, let me reference the Bible. Let me see what my Bible says about that subject. Okay, you know what? I think I posted on uh, Facebook the other day. It was First Peter... Uh, uh, nine three or one nine and said, you know, don't trade insult for insult. 
So when you cussing and fussing and arguing and insulting people, you know, well, let me, let me see. This Bible says, the Bible says don't do that. You won't be blessed. If you're afraid or, under, or unashamed to say yes to the ways of Jesus and no to the ways of the world, then you're a radical. You're a radical that's counterculture follower of Jesus Christ. So you don't follow the culture. We also talk about once accepting Jesus in your life as the Lord over your life, then there are some things he's expecting or in some cases commanding you to do. He wants us to move from being consumer Christians to connected Christians. We talked about Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Don't forsake the assembly to getting together. Don't forsake. Find ways to get together, to fellowship, to encourage, to come on Sunday, to come to the men's group, women's group. Find ways to get involved so you can be encouraged and you can encourage others. Just like the disciples, he wants us to gather together, eat together, ask questions and learn from him and the word together. You don't understand something about the word, gather together so we can talk about the word. And it's okay if we wrestle with the word. We're supposed to wrestle with the word. Supposed to, the word is supposed to get us to do things that we shouldn't be doing. That's wrestling. It's okay. You can reference uh, Romans 12, 6 through 8, if you so choose to, for those that weren't here last week, that speaks to that. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. And 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, if you need it. But I'll summarize it for you. It says, God has given us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. They are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. So we all get them from the same place. And we are to use them well to serve one another, and we are to do it with all our strength and energy that God supplies us. Then everything we do together will bring glory to God. Then he wants us to, we learn that we are not only to go from connected to committed, he wants us to be compelled. We talked about that last time. I said compel is like a kid. Go. You know enough to go get the, you know enough. You know how you know enough to go be compelled to do something? Because of what he's done in your life. You know, and I said this before, the list is long. You know in your heart of hearts before bedtime and when you wake up in the morning what he's done for you. So you should be compelled to share your story because that story, that testimony is going to help someone else. You can't contain what Jesus is doing in your life. All the intricacies of things he does is just not for us. They're for others to see. And it helps when another human being, brother, sister, male or female is telling you, look, I was here, now I'm here, all because of Jesus. I want some of this Jesus. Even if they don't want Jesus now, drop that seed. Move on. Don't get caught up if they're doing things we don't like. Do your part. Spread the gospel. Go. We talked about the folks in Acts 2. They were compelled after their experience and the vision that Jesus gave them. And I read to you this way. Excuse me, I read to you, I ended last week's message with this, and it's going to actually start this message today. It is our responsibility as followers of Jesus to be his ambassadors or representative on every platform. Wherever in life you are, that's considered a platform. God has placed us on these platforms for a specific purpose. I forgot that was even in my message. And when we begin to recognize, hmm, I recognize this now, we will bring his influence into our vocation, business, schools, communities, and our cities. As people begin to see our relationship with Jesus by the way we live, by the way we talk, families will be changed, neighborhoods will be changed, and cities will change. We, you know what, I was thinking, we, we talk about always changing. But somewhere along the line, you, you got to be willing and open and committed to a change. Our, everything in, our, in America, United States of America and around the world, something's got to give, something's got to change. And it's up to us to start somewhere. We don't, we don't always have to think about the, changing the world. 
We don't always have to be in, uh, committed to changing the world. We have to be committed what God is calling us to do right now next to the person we're standing with, sitting with, talking with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we begin to change. That's how, because we can't, I, we've said it before, we can't change a thing. I don't know what I've changed. Do you know what you've changed? Can we change another person? Only Jesus can, because you've got to get to their heart. Only Jesus, God can get to their heart. We cannot. Amen? And when a city has changed, it garners the attention of its country. You know, when you start doing things, people want to know. They're like, oh, the atten- I'm getting all this attention. Well, yeah, I'm getting the attention today because although my birthday is next week, but you see the work that I'm doing. I'm not hiding nothing. Yeah, I have flaws. Yeah, I have issues, problems, concerns. But you see me committed. You see something taking place in me. So because of that, you honor me. You give me a gift. You say thank you. That's what it's about. Glory to God. When you gain this tension of, of its country, when a country has changed, the world will notice. Now that may be, that may take a little while, and it may not be in our lifetime, but we need to be committed to something. We talked about that earlier. You want to play these bongos? You got to be committed. You want to play the guitar, the drums, the instrument? You got to be committed. You want to graduate school? You got to be committed. How come we committed to everything else? And we struggle with that commitment when it comes to serving God, we try to figure out what to do. We're not committed. We got to be committed to something. We, what are our kids, if they're not learning from us what we're committed to, how are they going to you expect them to be committed to something? And that's a wake up call for me. Look, this is a real life we live in here. Nobody's perfect. We're all striving to get together, but at least we're striving to get together. We're striving for something. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So today, part two is our uh, Connected series. And this time I want to talk about who is God. Now, um, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, it, it, it may be very basic for some, and it may not be basic for some. But some of us need to get back to the basics. So I'm going to take, I'm going to attempt to take it back to the basics, to reiterate, to remind, to confirm in us all who God is. You okay with that? Yeah. Amen. So in order for us to be a radical follower of Jesus, we have to know who he is and where he comes from. So this subject today might be basic, but it's okay because we're going to get back to the basics and we're going to come out strong. And God works through basics. He works through basics, y'all. You can say, I go into this church and they keep saying the same thing. Well, just what think about the people that keep coming to church that need what's being said, the basic things that need to be said. Love God, love people. That's kind of basic. But sometimes you need to be reminded, you got to love God and love people. So what you hear and read today may be different from what you hear and read tomorrow, next week or next month. But it's still God. So who is God? So let's stop and think. And if you, just, if you stop and think who he is, some of us may think he's a he. Some of us must think he's a she or God's a she or an it. Maybe we think, uh, you know, God is the, who you call on and, and, uh, and, and for emergencies. Maybe it's God, it's some cosmic larger than life entity. Maybe you don't believe God, you, you, you don't believe in God, but you know there's a God. We all can go our different ways as to what God is, who God is, and whatever God is, and whatever you think he is. We've been trained, we've been shaped by our parents, by our church, by our own minds, and our own image of what God is. We all see these images that were shaped in our minds, whether from our parents, our church, our thinking, our community, but, we're, do, but do we really know who God is? I know I kind of said that twice, but do we really know who God is? 
One thing's for sure is that none of our images or words can adequately capture or describe who he really is. Even if we use all the descriptive words in the dictionary, we still wouldn't be able to describe the magnitude of who he is. This author named Skip Moen, a Christian author, says, God does not come to us in nicely defined, rationally explained thought categories. God does not fit himself into theological textbooks. For some that think he's theological, for some theolo theologians that think he's just in a theologic textbook. He's just not in there. God breaks all the rules. He is near, yet transcendent, clothed in human form, yet holy, more terrifying than one can imagine, yet compassionate, invisible, yet revealed, judging, yet merciful, sovereign, yet humble. No matter where you look, God breaks all those modes. Think about Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, which this quote kind of echoes. It says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. That mean, he don't, he don't think the way we think. And my ways are far beyond, far of anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So that's telling us that he is in everything, about everything, he is everything. We cannot put a pulse, we cannot put our fingers on the pulse of who God is. And sometimes we shouldn't. Sometimes we need to let God be God. Romans 11, 33, 36 says, Who could ever wrap their minds around the riches of God, the depth of his wisdom, and the marvel of his perfect knowledge? Who could ever explain the wonder of his decisions, search out the mysteries, mysterious ways he carries out his plans? For who has discovered how the Lord thinks or is wise enough to be the one to advise him of his plans? Don't we feel like this right now? And because God is the source, sustainer of everything, everything finds fulfillment in him. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We don't know why he does what he does. We don't know why people die. I mean, you know, we don't know why people die when they die. We don't know why people that live to be 107. We don't know why people smoke, drink, cuss, all these other things live the way they live. We think, you know, you do all those kind of things, you're supposed to be dead earlier. But check, just check that out. We're saying that you should be dead earlier. When George Burns, who lived to be 102 or 105 or something, he died, everybody was like, well, he smoked cigarettes. Cigars. Cigars. He should have been dead. Well, who are we? Think about it. Just because I kill somebody, does, do I need to be killed? We, we don't know what God's got planned for me. Think, th think about the audacity we had to even think that way. That we should be saying, because you do X, Y, and Z, you need to die. You need to go to hell. You need to pay the price. That means we're taking a position over God. We don't understand why things take place. And it's hard for us. It's easy for me to teach that. Easy for me to say right now because it's in my message. But it's hard for us to fathom that we're not God. Let God be God. Let's concentrate on what he has us concentrate. Let's concentrate on what he wants us to concentrate on, that is loving God and loving people. Everything else will work itself out. That's God. <laughs> you want to talk to somebody? I got a question for you. Why me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is only when he reveals and God reveals himself to us that we begin to know him, have a relationship with him, love him for who he truly, truly is. You know, when you, we use us as an example again. We were rolling in the dough uh, back in the day when the mortgage real estate industry was rolling and things were going well. We had six-figure income. We had cars. Everything was paid for. Kids had savings. We had a savings. We had this, that, and the other. And you name it, we the whole, everything. Our bills, more money, more problems. We had like $14,000, $17,000 bills per month, and we were able to pay them. So we were rolling. <laughs> but we didn't have a personal relationship with them. You know how it come? Because we had things good. 
we had no, we had no, we had no, re- well, we had a reason still to be thankful. And we were thankful and we tithed and we were, you know, big tithes at the church that we are, we were in and we gave big checks and we did this and, you know, we did that. Well, I rub, we're good Christians because you tithe. It takes more than just tithing to make you a Christian. So we did all this stuff and didn't have a personal connection with our father. But when we lost it all, whoo, that personal experience came really quick. <laughs> because I couldn't depend on her and she couldn't depend on financially getting us out of this circumstance or situation. I couldn't depend on her and she couldn't depend on me. I didn't have the answer. Mr. Fix-It, Mrs. Fix-It, when you don't have the answers, that's when you experience God. That's when you go, wait, wait, hold on. Uh, whoa, I can't call Mary, can't call Joe, I can't call my parents. Whew. That's when you experience God. You can't relate to someone that ain't been there, done that yet, if you not ain't been there, done that yet. Try to go up in the neighborhood and save somebody, and you keep beating them in the head with the Bible, talk about Jesus. They're trying to get a job, get to the store and feed their family. Something's off there. So how does he reveal himself? Let's talk about three ways he reveals himself. Let's talk about the creation. Through his creation, there's, there's three primary ways he does this. Reveal himself as one is through creation, one is through his son, Jesus Christ, and the other is through scripture. So we, let's talk about them. Three categories, won't be long. So God reveals himself through creation. God is everywhere. Just take a step outside and you will be surrounded by his systematic intricacies of his creation. You know what? Turn your head to your left. Turn your head to your left. Look at that person. Turn your head to the right. Look at that person. Systematic intricacies right there. You can't make that person. They may have come, for the women may have come out your womb, and for the men may have come from your seed, but you can't make them. Your DNA, you didn't start the DNA. That's intricacies of God's holy work right there. You can't mess with that. He is the mountains, the beaches, the jungles, the ocean depths, the prairies, the farmland, the deserts, deserts, valleys, to the people right in front of you. Only God. That's who he is. Romans 1.20. Pay attention to this. Write this down. This is deep. So when you think about and read this scripture, think about yourself, but think about other people in, in nowhere America, nowhere Africa, nowhere uh, Antarctic, any other country. Just think of a name, you know, Ibakawa, Alaska. Read the scripture. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his visible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. We have no excuse. According to the scripture, near one of us. Translation, uh, uh, the passing translation says, Opposition to the truth cannot be excused on the basis of ignorance. Ooh, that's kind of deep. Because from the creation of the world, the invisible qualities of God's nature has been made visible, such as his internal power and transcendence. He has made his wonderful attributes, his wonderful attributes, standing right here in front of you, <laughs> easily perceived for seeing the visible makes us understand the invisible. So then this leaves everyone without an excuse. Think about that for a moment. Sometimes something is so beautiful we can only stand in awe of his presence. That is God. To see God's creation is to see God and to know God's creation is to see God. We may not understand why he does what he does, but for those of us who have been around for a while, we know we love him. We know he has been our savior. We know that he has come at the 11th hour and 59th second. We know that if it's only because of him that we are where we are and alive today, when you experience him, you get to know him. 
Hallelujah. To know God is to understand the Trinity. Not my daughter Trinity, but the other Trinity, which is central to our Christian faith. I just dropped, you know, put a smile on her face, sorry. <laughs> oh, Dad, stop it. Moving on. It's the belief that one... I'm going to read some of this because I don't want to miss and capture this. And we're getting back to the basics, so bear with me. This is blowing my mind, so I hope it blows your mind. It says here, it's the belief that one God has disclosed himself eternally as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not the belief in three gods or of one God in three different modes, function, and operation. Here's, over here, you know, here's God over here, here's God over here, here's God over here. No, God is all one. He is all one. He is three, eter he is in three eternal distinct, distinct persons who live eternally involving in a loving community of one. Whoo! One. I mean, that, that's like, bam. That blows my mind. We see the differentiation between God, the Spirit, of God, God's word distinctively in Genesis. In the beginning, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning, not the end, but the beginning, God prepared, God prepared, form, fashion, created the heavens and earth. One. The earth was without form, an empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. The Spirit of God, two was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, three, he spoke. Let there be light, and there was light. That's deep. Three all in one? I am one wrapped in one. He is three all in, all in one. That's deep. The one God creating, moving, speaking as one. That's the God that loves you. That's the God you're hinging your life on. He's got your back. That's deep. Hallelujah. The second way God reveals himself is through his son, Jesus Christ. In John, first, in John 1, verses 1 through 14. Man. I mean, to, there was, I, I know Pastor Green loved science and loved God's more. But we was on TV and they were talking about scientists Something about figuring out the planets, and they realized something ain't right. You know, like, and I was like, "Oh, duh!" I didn't, couldn't even speak that language. I understood some of it. I was like, "Duh!" They they took a map of, of like virtual reality thing, and the planets kept going out. And he stood where the planets were, and they realized that there was something else over here, and that the way they originally said it and designed it or thought it was, it wasn't. You ever think oh, it's crazy as heck? But you ever think about the Earth? And you like fly out of the earth, like where are you gonna go? <laughs> no, seriously, think about it. Put it here's the earth. You fly out of the earth, like you're not in the earth, no. And you just like jog. Where do you go? That's God. That's God. If you go up out of the earth, where do you go? You go down, left or right, north, east, south, or west. Where do you go? That's God. He's, his ways are unfathomable. Our minds, our minds, our minds can't comprehend what he does. Even if you're the smartest dude on the planet or woman on the planet, you still can't figure out that. No matter what textbooks we read, we still don't even know how vast his magnitude, how powerful, how glorified he is. So he reveals himself through Jesus. It says, in the beginning, again, before all time, the Word, Jesus was the Word, excuse me, Jesus and the Word was with God. And the Word was God himself. He, Jesus, was present originally with God. All things were made and came to existence through him, and without him was not even one thing made. In him was life. The life was the light of, the, of, of men. The light shines in the darkness, for the darkness is never overpowered by it. Like the sun. No matter where you go, the sun's shining. Jesus' light is everywhere. You ain't no excuse for not noticing where he is, who he is, what he is. 
There's no excuse. You go outside, you see it. Look at your neighbor, you see it. There came a man sent from God. Oh, whose name was John, who's not God. This man came to witness and he might testify to the light that all men might believe in, adhere to, trust, rely upon through him. That's Jesus. He was not the light himself, but came that he might bear witness regarding the light. There it was, the true light coming into the world that illuminates every person. He came into the world, and, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, did not know him. Verse 11, he came to that which belonged to him. They who were his own did not receive him. That's a whole other message. Did not welcome him. But to as many who did receive and welcome him, he gave them authority, power, privilege, and right to become the children of God to those who believe and trust in him. Jump down to verse 14. Amen. And the word Jesus became flesh, incarnate, and tabernacle with us. And we actually saw his glory, his honor, his majesty, such glory as only begotten son received from his father. That's how God reveals himself through Jesus. You see, in John's account, John opens up the first, in John's account, excuse me, John opens up the astounding claim in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Notice the word is eternal. Before the beginning began, he was already here. He already was. The word is personal. He was with God. The word was part of God himself. This word, the eternal self-communication of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is among us. What's going to blow your mind is what I'm going to tell you a little later that you are Jesus. You are a part of Jesus. You have authority and power. Hallelujah. The word in Genesis 1 and John 1 is none other than the one who we know as Jesus Christ. The third way God reveals himself is through his word. Real simple. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, 7 says, All scripture is inspired by who? God. And is used to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. The way you live in without this is wrong. The way I'm living without this is wrong. I ain't say that. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Do the right thing and the right thing will happen. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to every good work, to fill any assignment. Say any assignment. Any assignment. Any assignment. Any assignment. Andre, any assignment. Okay. I needed to hear that. Any assignment, whether it be little or small, it has a purpose. It's an assignment. You've been called by God, then you have an assignment. Scripture is God's revelation to himself, to us, his plan of redemption for us, which he accomplishes through his son. We may not fully understand it or be able to comprehend the many aspects of God, but we search for, but if we search him out for greater knowledge, it says here, what I put down here, our minds will be expanded and we will come to know him more deeply. You keep studying the word, you get, no, you get closer to him. Draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. Next thing you know, we're one. So, through, her, through him all things were made, including us. Now we know that. We know that somebody had to create us, and the believers here believe that God created us. I think even non-believers believe that. But that's not the point here. It's not that you didn't know this. I want to inter- reiterate this to you today in this way. Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Then God said, let the earth produce very, every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals, and scurry th- that scurry along the ground and wild animals. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, small animals, each able to produce offsprings of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. You know what else he saw was good? You and I. You're good, I'm good. He's good. He does good. He is good. He was good. He's still good. He's going to continue to be good all the time. Amen? 
Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. Now, I studied this. Glory to God. I studied, I was going through my favorite NLT, New Translation Bible. Y'all heard me say it before. And I read Genesis. And this is before I started to study. And in this, I highlighted and I underlined. I can't really see, but I know where my highlights are. It says, let us, I said us, highlight. I'm like, who is us? Make human beings in our image. Highlight our. Who is our? To be like us. Who the heck is this us? And God is one. That was my thinking. But check, we already know who he is. He is the Trinity. He is God. He's the Holy Spirit. And he, well, he's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's us. But check this out. Who is us? I explained to you who us is. Who did he make? Us. You know who we represent? Us. Follow what I'm saying. He is us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He makes us. We are image of his us. You feel what I'm saying? You understand? No. Say by, shake your hand if you say no. I'm going to keep explaining it. Nobody, everybody says yes? Okay. I'm going to break it down. Keep following me. Keep following me. I used to wonder why the Bible kept saying us. Answer here. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Whose who's, who's image? Our image. The one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be like us. That will reign over the over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, the white animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Us. He's given us control over all that. So God created human beings in his own image, in us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the image, God created them male and female. So every male and female is the image of God. Every time you speak to someone, they're in the image of God. So watch how you speak to them because when you speak to them disrespectfully, you're disrespecting the us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Scripture. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in you. We have certain characteristics that he has in us, from us. Amen? It says here. There was no conflict or destruction, no disease or pollution. Everything was the way God intended it to be. And what we intended for you, what he intended for you and I, his creation was to have a unique relationship with him. So us creates us for a purpose. We're to have this unique, special relationship with him. Us creating us, special relationship with him. Us, three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We were made to have children to fill the earth, subdue the earth, rule the earth, take care of the earth. You can read that in Genesis 1, 26 through 31. He made us to be creators and to be good stewards of what, he, what we create, mirroring, mirroring, mirroring what he created. So I'm supposed to take care of, you're supposed to take care of what he, what he allowed us to create. In the same care that he cares for us, we're to care for the land. We're to care for each other. We're to care for every single thing that walks this earth. Do we do that? Do we do that? Some of us may do it, but not all of us. Us created us. That is some deep revelation there. You know, we used to, you talk about like global warming. Take care of the, the plastic bottles. Don't litter. Some of us, you know, kind of fluctuate on that. We'll litter. Some won't. We'll drink out of plastic, crush it, throw it away in the wrong container. You're thinking, no big deal. I don't have time to be thinking about all those intricacies. Intricacies. Intricacies that he created us for. We created the plastic bottle. We created this global warming. We're supposed to be care. We're supposed to take care of what he's given to us. We're not doing that. So I'm like you all. At one point in my life, I was like, so what? Instead of taking care of the earth, I'm trying to take care of me and my family. Well, hold up. We all play a part. We all play a part. Whatever you're on the left or right of this global warming position, you still have a right to take care of the land that you walk on every day. You see something, pick it up. You can't pick up everything because it's kind of germy. You don't even know what you're going to get. But use wisdom. We're supposed to take care of what God gives us to take care of that he made us towards over, which is each other. Do you, you understand what I'm saying here? Us created us from us. It says take care of the us that you created, the mess that you created, take care of it. 
Amen? Hallelujah. We may not fully comprehend, but you get into the Word, your comprehension becomes higher, greater, and stronger. You realize that we all have a purpose. Whether you understand or don't understand it, keep fulfilling what God has given you. Now, we know somewhere along the way something went wrong. Sin entered. That powerful destruction entered sin. We all know the story of Adam and Eve. Serpent deceived that, uh, Eve. Eve gave it to a man named Adam. Adam blamed her. She blamed the serpent. Woo, all around. God said, what y'all doing? Sin entered the, 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 sin entered the world. It destroyed everything that you could think of. It destroyed our relationship with him. It destroyed our relationship with each other. Male and female arguing who's, who, 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 is on, who wants to be king and queen and who wants to be on top and I'm in control and who wants to be mean and listen to me. We have no peace. Marriages are failing because everybody wants to be controlled. The woman don't respect me and the man don't love me. That's what Adam and Eve created. He done messed up our whole relationship with each other. Remember, it was peaceful. It wasn't destructive. God created us to take care of this earth, which was okay then. And I'm going to get a little funny on you. You can take this all the recording. But I have a little thing here. You know what my sayings are. I said them before. I'm going to talk about the naked word. They didn't know they was naked. They don't say butt naked. <laughs> you're naked, but you're butt. They were naked. And they ate from the tree. She ate from the tree. They ate from the tree. The, the devil deceived them. They became butt naked. Because why? Because they started covering themselves. They didn't know they were naked. In Europe, you fly on, you go on the bus. I lived in Europe for four years, in London in particular, and in Japan. They watch um, the, uh, exposed bodies on the newspaper, and that's no big deal to them. Right or wrong, I'm just saying. My, my, I'm making a, uh, an example here, just saying to you, you don't know until you know. Right. And they weren't supposed to know that. Death, destruction into the world. They weren't supposed to know that they were naked, that the women had things that we were supposed to covet with each other in marriage. And the men had what he had to covet with his wife in marriage. They didn't know that. But they knew it then. And God does not tolerate nor can he tolerate the destruction of his creation. It has damaged us, our lives, and our relationships with him and with each other. So the Adam and Eve choice that they made, because the choice they made, there were consequences. When we talk about consequences before, the words you say have consequences. You say them words that you use, you could lose your job and lose your life. It has consequences. The consequences of their choice, actions brought upon corruption, war, hate, disease, bigotry, racism, selfishness, greed, deceit, rape, murder, theft, fear, guilt. Every relationship was tainted, damaged, and fractured. You say, Andre, well, Pastor Andre, that's a lot of bad news. Well, it is bad news because that's what we, where we live in. Instead of intimacy with God, there was fear and hiding. Instead of intimacy between men and women, which I talked about earlier, there was shame, hurt, and struggle for power. Every creation groans under the weight of their disobedience. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. Death don't necessarily mean you dying per se. Death could be in your marriage, your finances, your life with your spouse, your, 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 your relationship with your children, death in school, death in work. Death. Death, by, by death is a byproduct of our own sim, sinful choices, the result of someone else's choice or just living in a tainted world. So we talk about people dying. Well, maybe they didn't do anything to die, but because they live in, we live in a sinful world, a tainted world, they did. Not because of what I did, it's because of what we all did. Maybe not because we all did, because somebody else did. A byproduct. The Bible is very clear on that fact. Unless our sin problem is addressed, we will continue to experience, continue experience spiritual death in every aspect of our life. But guess what, y'all? There came a Redeemer. That's the good news, because I was like, dang. Y'all looking at me all funny, like, oh, this bad news. <laughs> I ain't finished yet. I'm almost finished. But there's a Redeemer. 
His name is Jesus. Hallelujah, that someone came for us, that sacrificed their life for us. I'm having discussions with people, and people say that, um, um, you know, we're doing so much, we're taking on so much. What if we just give it to Jesus? What, what if, you know, just let you take it, Jesus? I don't need to do everything. If we would just, people have a problem with Jesus because they look like this toxic relationship. It could be toxic, but the thing is this, if you take the weight off of you and put the weight on someone who died for us, when we didn't deserve it, we didn't even deserve it. We didn't even deserve it, and he died for us. He walked, struggled, carrying that cross up to Calvary for us, for you and me. Guess what? For the black man, for the white man, for the Asian man, for the brown man, all of us. You ain't white, I ain't black. You know what? I'm a Christian. That's, I forget, I forget what, how eloquently Pastor Grady said, you know when I go off, sometimes I trip on my words. <laughs> because I'm just so, I mean, I'm not a hype man. <laughs> anyway, this is not who I am. You get caught up in my color. But who I am is right here. Who I am is right here. So we have a redeemer. And listen to the redeeming aspect of all this. God himself came down to the world as Jesus Christ and begins to reverse the curses of sin, death that have ravaged our humanity ever since Adam and Eve. So God, the Trinity, came down himself in the form of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins who he created. For, who he created. See how wonderful God is? All this figure eight stuff is still him. He died the death we were supposed to die to give us the life we could never attain for ourselves. Meaning we can't do nothing without him. You can't do anything. You can't, if you ain't counseling God, who are you counseling? You can't serve two masters at the same time. You put two people up here, one's going this way, one's going the other way. Can you follow them at the same time? You become cross-sided. Because you can't figure out who you're supposed to follow. We're supposed to follow him. You're the radical Christian. Follow him. He'll lead you to peace, tranquility in your home, in your marriage, in your school. How many want peace? How many want peace? Amen. I'm going to tell you, if I, in Valentine's Day, I had to give her kudos. I said, look, I wouldn't know what peace was until I met you. Someone look at that post and go, you know, he's all weak. And, no, look, God knew to send me somebody to check me because I would have been gone. I would have been gone. I mean, you know, I may be some light-skinned brother, short and all that, but I was a thug thizzle myself. You ain't the only one thug thizzle. <laughs> I'm saying I made some decisions that I could have been gone already. I was another religion. I believed in something else. God said, I ain't done with you yet, boy. I was in places where you could have got killed, stomped on, murdered. God said, I ain't done with you yet. I was spiritually lost. God said, I ain't done with you yet. Apparently, he's not because I'm still here. Amen. I'm almost done. So in my closing here, when Jesus died on the cross, our old selves died with him. So stop holding on to the sin. Repent. Pastor Gray said, move on. Don't stay there. Don't stay where the enemy wants you to stay. And when Jesus rose from the dead, our new selves rose with him. I'm a new creation in God, in Jesus Christ. He restored our relationship with God. Imagine, these, imagine Jesus standing here. Here's God, here's you. Here's Jesus. He's doing this, he's doing this. Next, next, next. He broke the power of sin over us so that we may overcome the evil in ourselves and in this world. You may not think you have a purpose when you leave here. You have a purpose. Romans 5 through 6 through 11. Um, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. He is a right on time kind of God. And die for our sins. Most people would not be willing to die 
for an upright person because someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. He sent Jesus in the midst of all of these sinners. But Jesus said, oh, man. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Jesus, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship was with God was restored by death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. The life of his son. The bloodline right there. So now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Redeemer made it very clear that the path back to God was open to everyone. What did we say earlier? Whether you gay, straight, your ginger, gender, religious dedication, guilt, accomplishments, or any other human measurement. So wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, God is there for you. Jesus is there for you. The Holy Spirit is there for you. So how is this Redeemer, how does this Redeemer work? We call Jesus. Some basic, I'll just run through it real quick. Admit you're a sinner. Have the courage to step out and say, you know what, I'm a sinner. Have your actions and your thoughts back that up. That you were once separated with God, but you have the ability to be one with God. You are not able to bridge the gap between you and God through your own effort. Trying harder is not the answer. Being eloquent is not the answer. Authentically admitting this to God will allow you to build a bridge to relationship with him. Number two, believe in Jesus and what he has done. How is he working in your life? What sacrifice did he make for you? Who else, sacri who else is making that kind of sacrifice? Jesus was 100% human, 100% God. He died on the cross and as a sacrifice to make payment for your sins and rose from the dead, conquering death for all who believe. Lastly, commit yourself to him. Commit to follow Jesus. Be committed to something. How are you going to walk through life? How are we going to walk through life and not committed to anything? Be committed to something. Jesus says, commit to me. Commitment is more than just a sentimental prayer of intellectual accent, assent. Commitment is being the farm on the fact that, be, be, betting the farm on the fact that belief in Jesus alone saves you and then living that truth. It means making Jesus your personal friend, your personal leader, your confidant, your counselor, and the object of your worship. Amen? That's who God is. If you don't know that, now you know. You can look at the scriptures. You can do your own research. You can study out. Or you can look at your life. That's who God is. God is the Father. He is the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we are of the same trinity. We have the ability to do those, fulfill those characteristics that God is. We have the ability to do it, step into our authority to save people, to encourage people, to give them hope, to say nice words to them, to love them right where they are, to be kind, to smile, to hug, to don't judge and condemn. That's what God is expecting for all of us to keep encouraging us to do. This world can be a better place and it can start right here with you. Amen? Let's pray.